The following program is rated U for universal audiences and is considered suitable for listeners of all ages. This is a presentation of Dream Realm Enterprises, where dreams are our reality. Back to Q Who, the quintessential Whovian podcast. I'm your host, John Russell. And of course, on this podcast, we talk about classic Doctor Who, which means Doctors 1 through 8, William Hartnell, all the way up through Paul McGann. And we talk about the, the episodes, we give reviews, talk about any news concerning uh, anything that has to do with the classic series, like DVD and Blu ray releases, audiobook releases book releases, you name it, we talk about it as long as it pertains to the first eight Doctors, the original run of the series, the classic series. Uh, we don't talk about the new series here because I think there's plenty of podcasts out there that cover that, and uh, my main interest in Doctor Who does tend to be the classic series, though I do appreciate the new series for its own merits. Um <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm all about the classic series, um, especially the early years. I really love the early years. And uh, so, yeah, I have been doing this watch through and listen through. I've been watching through the episodes starting from the beginning, and I've been listening to the audiobooks in in chronological order or in the order that they were shown on television, at least. And uh, trying to give my two cents worth on that and comparing them to, you know, their television counterparts. And we left off last time with The Reign of Terror. I did a uh, review of the audiobook. And uh, before that, of course, I talked about season one. And I did it all in like uh, two, two different episodes. So for season two, I'm going to cover it in about three, probably about three episodes at least. Um, rather than trying to rush through it and cram everything in and not really get to thoroughly examine story per story, you know, uh, uh, doing it the way that I did season one. Um, yeah, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of details and so forth were left out as far as I felt about that. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to take my time and on this episode of Q Who, we will just probably talk about the first two or three stories of season two, which begins, of course, with Planet of Giants. I, uh, it, I, I've always had a love-hate relationship with Planet of Giants. <laughs> um, it's never been one of my favorite stories, I have to admit, and as much as I love Hartnell and the Hartnell era, um, Planet of Giants never really did a lot for me. I think maybe the, the most interested I ever was in Planet of Giants was probably the very first time I watched it 30-odd years ago. Uh, and I found it fascinating because, you know, the TARDIS crew being shrunk down <laughs> to an inch and uh, running across all these giant ants and so forth. That, that element of the story is really fascinating, and I really think that... Uh, they should have stuck with just that, um, but then they they felt like they had to add in the subplot of a murder story. It's not even a murder mystery, which um, I think if they'd have at least gone with that angle where somebody was killed and they sort of witnessed it from afar like that, where they were small and couldn't really do a whole lot, but they had to investigate it and find out you know, who was killed and why and so forth and solve this mystery, that would have been a much more interesting story. But um, instead, what we got was um, something that from the get-go, we know what's going on, we know why it's going on, and it just kind of shows the ugly side of humanity. And that's all going on while the TARDIS crew are trying to figure out a way out of their own predicament which is being shrunk down to an inch and trying to survive the various um, hazards of that. And then you, you've got DN6, this pesticide situation involved, which 
ups, you know, it ramps up the danger for the TARDIS crew, but um, it's just not very interesting, <laughs> I have to admit. Um, so, Planet of Giants is probably my least favorite Hartnell story, um, just because I just don't think it gels at all, and it 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 gelled so poorly that during the off season. They decided to cut it down from a four-parter to a three-parter. They combined episodes three and four into one, so it became a three-parter. And they did do, whenever they did the DVD release, they did a reconstruction of, you know, all four episodes. Put, put three and four back as, you know, they took the scripts and they recorded with sound-alikes and also with, uh, with William Russell and Caroline Ford. Um, but they had sound alikes for the first Doctor and Barbara, and it you know that was adequate. That was interesting. I'm I'm not a big fan of you know other people coming in and playing iconic roles like that. Um, but the guy that they got to do the first Doctor, I thought did did a really good job, and the girl that did Barbara was you know she was passable. So it's an interesting novelty <laughs> to to witness. But it just actually goes to show why they decided to cut episodes three and four together as one <laughs> one episode because the story just doesn't move. There's the story uh, after episode one, you kind of get the gist of it, and you know at that point I'm kind of over it. Um, the the rest of you know episodes two and three, as it is you know now. Uh, just aren't that interesting. You, you, it's just kind of it's 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 a slog. It really is. It's very tough to get through, um, and I'm just bored most of the time because we have this plot about D and Six and the businessman who has no scruples, and I don't know. You know, it it, it just um, it just doesn't play. <laughs> it doesn't play very well, if you ask me. Um, so I'm not that fond of Planet of Giants just for that. I mean, I love the idea, the concept of the, you know, the TARDIS crew being shrunk and, you know, they run into the, you know, the giant ants and the giant cat and all these different things, which is really interesting. But then with that subplot of the, the murder and everything in D&6, it just really slows the story down rather than helping it at all. So they'd have just turn that into like a murder mystery or they just hadn't had, you know, if they just didn't have that subplot at all, I, I think it would have made a nice two parter. Um, but sadly we're strapped with, <laughs> with that, um, lumbered with that, that subplot that just isn't interesting at all. So, um, yeah, for, for, uh, for the television version whether you watch it in three parts or four, it doesn't really matter. I just give it one and a half TARDISes. That's all I can possibly give it. One and a half out of five. It's really my least favorite one. You know, and it's not god awful or anything like that. But uh, it's you know there are there are bits of it that are watchable. Like I said, part one is actually pretty interesting, um, especially if you if you were to take out the whole um, D and six plot line. I think. Part one would flow wonderfully, but um, yeah, it just—it's a story that just doesn't flow. And when it came to the audio book, um, the audio book is 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 actually an improvement. It's definitely better. Uh, of course, it was adapted by Terence Dix and read by Caroline Ford in the uh, audio CD. It's a three CD set, and. Um, yeah, it it's it definitely was a better book than it was a television show, but it still doesn't you know it still doesn't stand out as one of the greats. Um, it's still kind of bogged down by that story. That uh, Terrence Dix at least took the elements from the the third and fourth episodes, and that that actually helped to tell the story and put them back in. To sort of explain some things that are going on and the motivations for Barbara and everybody else that you really don't get in the cut down episode three. Some of that's missing. You, you know, you can tell things are missing when you're watching episode three, but 
it's such a boring story. You don't care because you're just at the end of it. You're like, thank goodness that's over. <laughs> at least that's my take on it. Uh, I know there are people out there that really love Planet of Giants. I have heard from them before, but I it's just not one that does it for me. It doesn't appeal to me. And uh, the audiobook is definitely an improvement or the you know the novelization whether you read it or you listen to or caroline ford reading it it's a fine reading it um it comes across a lot better uh terrence dix took you know something that wasn't very good and made it at least passable made it tolerable made it an interesting read if not a great read um so i will give the audiobook or slash novelization, um, uh, two and a half Tardises out of five. So that's as good as it gets. It gets an, it gets one more point. <laughs> you know, it gets one more Tardis. But uh, we move on to the Dalek invasion of Earth, which is a thousand times better <laughs> than Planet of Giants. Thank goodness we we got a really good follow up to that. <laughs> um, season two started with a whimper, but then it. After that, it actually takes off, and the rest of the season is is actually really enjoyable. Um, Planet of Giants, I think, is the weakest point. A lot of people say that the, the Space Museum is the weakest point, but uh, I will disagree. I think the Space Museum is a little bit better, but I'll, well, I'll talk about that, of course, in another episode when we get down there to <laughs> to that area to, towards the end of Season 2. But right now, Dalek Invasion of Earth... Uh, it's a story that I really was never that into years ago. When I first saw it, um, it was interesting, but it, it didn't really capture my imagination like it does today. It's one of those stories that the older I get, the more it grows on me. And uh, while I always appreciated it for what it was, um, I don't know. There was something about it years ago that really just didn't do it for me. And I, you know, again, I can't really put my finger on why, but um, it just didn't seem to flow like the Daleks did. It didn't seem to flow like others around it that I thought were really good, um, like the Romans. I always enjoyed the Romans. I always enjoyed the Reign of Terror um, and so forth. Uh, I just thought there were better stories around it. But these days, I can see it for the gem that it is. And uh, it's, you know, of course, it's uh, Susan's departure, and that's all handled pretty well. I mean, it, it's kind of that cliché, oh, the companion falls in love and stays behind. But there's a little more to it than that, thankfully, because she's kind of reluctant. She wants to stay with her grandfather and, um, you know, look after him. And she feels that responsibility, even though she's longing to be with David and... Uh, kind of likes this idea of rebuilding the earth after the Daleks have devastated it and invaded. Um, there's a certain appeal there for her and, and having roots and belonging somewhere, but she's torn between that desire and wanting to honor her grandfather. And of course he takes that decision right out of her hands in a really nice twist at the end that you know, if you do, if you don't know the story, you, you you know you're you're just hit with it at the end, like wow, that that's unexpected and and really brilliant for the time. That's uh, not something you would have thought they would have done in a ch children's television program. Um, the way that they handled it, uh, this is a very grown up story, I think. Um, the you know the, the series was primarily made for children or for family viewing. Um, and I'm not. I'm not saying the Dalek invasion of Earth is, you know, is more adult. It, it's just a little more grown-up storytelling, and it's handled in a very, in a very good way. And uh, it's a it's a story that paces up very nicely. You know, there's a lot of variety in there. Um, it, it's it really does hang together. And as an adult, you appreciate it more than I did when I was. You, you know, when I was young, and maybe that's you know, maybe that's it. Maybe that's that's the whole point of why I enjoy it now compared to um, years ago. 
because when I was a teenager and seeing it for the first time, it just didn't really do it for me. And I think I see why, because it is kind of a more mature, more maturely written Doctor Who story. So we had some of that at the time. I mean, the the Reign of Terror very much is 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 a maturely written story. It's not written down to children um, in the way that the Censorites kind of is. The Censorites you can see is kind of oh well, you know, they have they have the the the, the, uh, the young audience in mind writing that one. Um, it's not. <laughs> particularly grown-up writing, but the Reign of Terror is, and Planet of the Giants really kind of is with the whole murder thing, and then uh, the Dalek Invasion of Earth very much is, and it, it is to its strength, it, as it is to the Reign of Terror strength, to be a grown-up story and, and written in a very mature way. The Dalek Invasion of Earth works on that level, and both of those stories, Reign of Terror and Dalek Invasion of Earth, probably didn't appeal to the younger audience at the time, but I will bet you most of them nowadays, now that they've grown up and they're older, they probably appreciate both of those stories more now than they did then, just like myself. Um, I didn't appreciate especially the Dalek Invasion of Earth as much as I do now, so I, I really think it's a cracker of a story. And um, it, it's, you know, it kind of... I, I don't know if I like it better than the Daleks. Um, if I do, it's by an inch. <laughs> you know, it's 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 they're 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 very different stories, and they're told in very different ways, and they're both told in very good ways. The Dalek Invasion of Earth, of course, is an episode shorter, so it paces up a little better, perhaps, and that's probably to its credit as well. It probably helps it to be an inch better than <laughs> than uh, the Daleks. So I give this, the televised story four TARDISes out of five. I think it's a, a solid entry and uh, a, a very good departure for Susan, who I've never really been a big Susan fan. I much preferred Vicky and was very happy for her to come in in the very next story. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a solid outing. Um, it's a good departure for Susan. I don't think it's an atypical, cliched kind of thing, just by the way that they handled it, the way that it was written. Um, it all made sense, and I love that little twist at the end where the Doctor locks her out of the TARDIS and says, you know, you're, you, you're, a, you're a grown woman now. You deserve to have roots. Go and have your life. I will see you somewhere down the line and make sure you're okay. You know, paraphrasing, of course, what the Doctor was saying. But that was the meaning of, of what he was trying to bring across to her. Now, um, getting into the audiobook, when I listened to it, um, it's an enjoyable, it's an enjoyable listen. I kind of feel like the television uh, episodes flowed a little bit better than the audiobook. I'm not sure why that was, but that was definitely my feeling listening to the audiobook. It's it's it is one of those paint by numbers novelizations. He didn't change a whole lot of that. He he added a bit here and there, and clarified some things and made certain things. I guess what he felt worked better than they did on television, and in some cases that's true. But overall, it doesn't quite flow as well as the episodes, and I'm not sure. I, like I said, I can't really put my finger on it, but that is how I kind of felt listening to it was. This is good, but it's just not quite uh, the same experience as watching it. Watching it is a better experience, and that's a rarity. Usually the books are better than, than the scripts, but in this case, I think, I think the episodes work just a little bit better. So for the audio book or, or you know, for the, the novelization, I, I give it three and a half TARDISes out of five. But the rescue is one that I've always kind of enjoyed because I, I really like Vicky, for starters, and it was a nice little introduction for her. And it's I kind of like the two-parters as well because they, they seem to flow really well. Um, I think they, you know, it's nice to have a shorter story once in a while that you can just get into and then get out of. 
And in this case, it definitely is to the story's benefit. It wouldn't have worked as a four-parter. They would have had to have added a lot more characters. And as it stands, uh, as a two-part story, it, it works very well. Um, so, I, you know, I, 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 I like the villain because there was a nice surprise there with Coquilliam being you know, Bennett, and uh, Bennett was the one responsible for the bad things that happened on the ship and, and killing Vicky's father, and she had no idea, and all these things. The Rescue is an, a quaint little story, and uh, it works on a lot of uh, levels. The TARDIS crew work very well together. Them meeting Vicky is, is interesting, and, of course, the Doctor having to deal with Bennett a.k.a. Coquillion, um, is, is quite fascinating. And uh, so I do, I, I like the two episodes. I give it three TARDISes out of five. I've always enjoyed The Rescue. It's, it's, it's a nice one. Um, the audiobook, so Ian Martyr did expand this quite a bit. For the, about the first episode, it's almost word for word. He didn't do a lot. But when he got into part two, the second half of the story, that's where he started really fleshing it out a bit. And we got to um, know a little bit more about the rescue ship and those people that are coming. And then we got to know a little bit more about the society on Dido, the planet that they're on. And how the doctor knows them and, and all this because the doctor refers to the, the Didoans or whatever you call them. Uh, he refers back to visiting their planet before. And uh, while we don't get a lot of background on that, even in the uh, novelization, there's a, there's, a, there's a good bit more information given. And um, we get to hear a little bit more about... Um, their society and what what they're about and so it's that ending is kind of expanded and and they're dealing with bennett aka coquillion is expanded and um i can't i have to say it's it's not really one of ian martyr's stronger books it I, it was the last one he ever wrote before his death I think, uh, I think he died before it was even published, if I recall correctly, so it was released posthumously. He had, it's, it's like he just finished it and then passed away, he had his heart attack and died. Um, he's a bit too descriptive, I, and that's one way that it's expanded, because as far as the dialogue and so forth and the story are concerned, like I said, for at least for part one, um, it's almost word for word, except in between all the dialogue and stuff, he's extremely descriptive to the point that it's, you know, it's like ad nauseum. It's just too much. It's just too much, and it's kind of a, a slog and a bit boring in parts. And while I appreciated the ending and what he did with with, the, with it, it, it picked up towards the end. Um, but for the first, you know, three quarters of the book, I was kind of bored because he was just entirely too descriptive, um, and it, I maybe he felt like he had to be because he he, he didn't want to write a really short <laughs> novel. He wanted to write you know a regular sized novel, but he only had you know two scripts to work with rather than four, so he stretched it so that it came out to around the same length as a four parter would have <laughs> if he'd adapted it. So, uh, yeah, he gets very descriptive in there, um, just to the point of you're just thinking, get on with it, please get on with it. And while Maureen O'Brien does a fine job with the reading of the audiobook, and, and it really helps, um, it's still just a bit of a slog, especially, like I said, for that first three quarters of the audiobook, um, of the novelization, it just doesn't flow like a lot of the other ones you know his adaptation of the reign of terror was beautiful he did a wonderful job on that and he didn't have to pad it with this i felt like he really padded it to try and get it into that <laughs> four episode type format and most of it didn't work the ending was nice i like what he did um with the last few chapters but the 
the first three quarters of the book, especially the first half of the book, it's it, it's really just a bit much. <laughs> it's it's kind of boring, and you're just kind of going, get on with it, please, get on with it, please. But uh, eh, it's it's not horrible though. It's not god awful. Um, it's you know it's passable. So that's why I give the the novelization slash audio book two and a half Tardises. It gets that extra half because Maureen O'Brien, of course, is wonderful as a reader. Um, and it was nice to hear her telling her character's first story, you know, her introduction. So I give it two and a half Tardises out of five. And uh, I think that's fair, considering. So uh, that's my take on the first three stories of season two. Next time we will get into the next bit, the middle bit of the season, and we'll talk about the next three stories, which are definitely, um, the, you know, the, the season's really starting to take off at that point. So, uh, you get past this initial hump, and, and yeah, I, 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 like I said, I really enjoyed the Dalek Invasion of Earth. I love the, the rescue on television, but from here, season two really takes off. And we'll get into that next time. So thanks for listening. I've rambled on for nearly half an hour. <laughs> really hadn't intended to even ramble on this long. But uh, yeah, that's my thoughts on the first third of season two of Doctor Who. Hopefully you enjoyed listening to me rambling on about it. So if you enjoyed it, come back next time for more of the same. And we'll talk about the middle section of season two of Doctor Who. Well, probably um, it will be the episode after the next one because I expect the next episode of Q Who actually to be my review of the Abominable Snowman Blu-ray steelbook release um, of the animated version of the Abominable Snowman. So that's probably what you're going to hear next if all, yeah, that goes well because um, I'm expecting that to arrive any day now. So that will probably be next. And then the following <laughs> episode of Q Who we'll get into the middle section of season two of Doctor Who. So bear with us, bear with us. Thanks for listening. You guys know the drill. Stay tuned. You have been listening to a fan production for Dream Realm Enterprises. This is a not-for-profit program.